Jeremiah, oh, chapter one tonight. So why don't we pray and then we'll jump in. Really, really looking forward to what the Lord has for us tonight. So let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much. Lord, we're so grateful to you. We're so thankful to you. There's just no way that we could ever possibly begin to <laughs> even express to you just how thankful and grateful we are. Thank you for your word, Lord. Thank you for this place, this church, this building that you've given us. Thank you for this time that we can have together on a Thursday night where we can just disconnect from all the busyness and the cares and the affairs, and in some ways even reconnect with you and your word. And so Lord, tonight we are just with great anticipation, looking forward to what it is that you desire to minister to us and speak into our lives. Escapono just pray, Lord. We don't want anything, anything to in any way distract us or take our minds off of You and Your Word. And Lord, we don't want our minds to wander as so often they're prone to. So Lord, don't let the enemy do that to us so that we can give You our undivided attention, especially for this amazing book, this amazing man, this amazing prophet, and this amazing ministry that you called him to. So Lord, thank you in advance for what you're going to do in our time together tonight. In your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. All right. <laughs> I have to confess that I know I say this about every book when we start a new book, but that's okay, right? So I have so been looking forward to teaching through the book of Jeremiah. Uh, we're in for quite a treat, I guess, for lack of a better word, as we get into this book and the study of this book and through this book. We're going to get to know this man, quite a man, mightily used of God, very interesting man. Um, his personality is going to really come out, unlike, by the way, Isaiah. You know, you come away from a study through the book of Isaiah, and it's such a, a powerful prophetic book about the Messiah. But conspicuously absent from the book is really anything personal about the prophet. And that's not the case, as we're going to see in our study through the book of Jeremiah. What's going to come leaping off the pages of this book is, oh, I mean, it's, it's very intensely personal, if I can say it like that. We're going to get to know who he was and how he was. And so we're really in for a treat. And I've been looking forward to this book for a number of reasons, chief of which is the profound parallels concerning Jeremiah's day and our day, as it relates to the prophecies about a dying nation, and for our application a dying world. I mean, this is the ministry to which Jeremiah was called. He would have to prophesy to a nation that was dying, and he would prophesy the coming judgment. And he would do this, as we're going to again see, for some 40 plus years. And thankfully, as was the case with Jeremiah and is the case with us today, God always packages the enabling with His calling. 
and such is the case with the calling that he had on Jeremiah's life. Absent the, the enabling, there was no way. Can you imagine being called to a ministry for 40 plus years and have no one respond, in fact actually have the opposite happen? Death threats, attempts on his life. We're going to see a close brush with death. God of course in His mercy spares him. But the beatings that he would take, all because he was, and this is the key word that I want us to know and hear and understand and embrace, faithful. Not successful. If, if the measurement, the gauge on Jeremiah's ministry was that of how successful he was, or how fruitful he was, I don't really believe we would have a book of Jeremiah in our Bibles. No, that's not the gauge. In fact, and this is really important, I guess, as a um, beginning to the book. Jesus said that there is coming a time when on that great and final day, we hear those words, enter in, good and thank you. Can you imagine if it was, enter in, good and successful servant. Oh, uh-oh. Not even that. We could even back it up a little bit if you want and say, good and fruitful servant. No good and faithful servant. He remained faithful despite seeing no one. I mean no one, not one. Not one person respond. 40 plus years. No one takes heed. And, and God, in all fairness, warned him that that was going to happen. How's that? Jeremiah, I'm calling you to this. <laughs> I, I don't want to get ahead of myself. Uh, but I, I do have to warn you that the message that I'm going to give you, the words that I'm going to put in your mouth, they are going to hate you and want to kill you when you speak them. So have a nice afternoon and have a nice ministry for 40 plus years. That's what Jeremiah is called to. So let's jump in. Are you ready? Yes. All right, good. You need to be. <laughs> Verse 1, the words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, of the priests who were in Anathoth, in the land of Benjamin, to whom, verse 2, the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the thirteenth year of his reign. Okay, first two verses, right out of the chute, provide us with some information concerning Jeremiah, namely that of him being a PK, a priest's kid, <laughs> slash pastor's kid, son of Hilkiah. Now, that's going to come into play here in a moment, so hang on to that. Verse 3, it came also in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, by the way, a good king, one of only nine, until the end of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, until the carrying away of Jerusalem captive in the fifth month. So notice the specificity there for a reason. And that reason is to provide us with the much needed details concerning the timing. So we know now who Jeremiah is. Now we know when Jeremiah was called. 
Now why is that important? Because think about this. You had a good king and you had a prophet, Jeremiah, simultaneously speaking to, reigning over Judah, leaving them with no excuse. You had the prophet Jeremiah prophesying. You had Josiah, one of only nine kings in all of Israel's history, really Judah's history, because <laughs> Israel had no good kings. Only nine kings, of whom it was said, they did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. Every other king did evil in the sight of the Lord. In our study through the kings, we saw this. It was really quite dramatic in a way, because like in the case of Josiah, a good king, he has a son who's an evil king. So you saw evil kings come from good kings, and good kings come from evil kings. And that's a whole other topic for another time. But for purposes of our understanding tonight, as it relates to the application of this and the understanding of this, this is important because this is a warning to Judah. You had a good king, Josiah, and you have the prophet Jeremiah that are doing everything they possibly can by the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit, and they don't take heed. Now, verse 4, Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Now this is arguably a well-known passage, these two verses, and for good reason, really, because it speaks to the forming of and the beginning of the conception of life. Life begins at, ex at conception. And I mean, it also speaks to the horrors of abortion, which I really don't want to get into tonight. But here God is saying to Jeremiah, I called you before you were even formed in the womb. I ordained you, I sanctified you as a prophet to the nations before your mom and dad even met. How about that? I knew you before I even formed you. Uh, one of the reasons why I'm always very careful and prayerful when it comes to abortion is because of the unnecessary guilt and condemnation that the enemy has been met with profound success when it comes to those who have had a, an abortion or been a part of an abortion. Let me just say, and maybe for someone either here or watching online, uh, abortion is not the unforgivable sin. Abortion is not the unforgivable sin. And sadly, Satan has been met again with profound and astonishing success in getting people to live under this crushing weight of condemnation having had an abortion. Listen, people, women who have had abortions for the rest of their lives, every time they see a child, a three-year-old, my baby would have been three years old. My baby would have been five years old. My baby would have been, my child would have been 10, and so on and so forth. And the enemy is right there. Don't let the enemy do that. God is a forgiving God. God is a forgiving God. God loves you so much. And here's some really good news. That baby, oh, <laughs> you're going to see him soon, soon and very soon, because that baby is in the presence of the Lord. So please, uh, that's all I'm going to say, and I want to get off track here. 
but I do want to spend just a little bit more time on this notion of being formed in the womb, let alone being called in the womb. The Apostle Paul, when he writes to the Galatians in chapter 1, beginning in verse 15, says, but when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through His grace to reveal His Son in me, that I might preach Him among the Gentiles. I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood. And he's just kind of explaining to them how it is and when it is and the way it is even that God called Him. He called Him when He was in the womb. Set Him apart. That's what the word sanctified means, to be set apart. Oh, you know how it is when we have something that is only for special occasions? We, all, we set it apart, we set it aside. You know that, that fine silverware? I mean, you're not eating, oh maybe I am, spicy ahi pokey with it. You're using probably a plastic fork. But when you bring out that silver, that's set apart for that special occasion. Well, that's really what sanctified means. And that's what God is saying to Jeremiah and Paul as well, and not just them, but David and the many others like them in Psalm 139. Beginning in verse 13, David by the Spirit says, For you formed my inward parts. I love this, how poetic. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. Ooh, I like that. I wish when I was knitted, knitted together in my mother's womb, they would have done. Anyway, that's another <laughs> issue, but I, I love the imagery of it. I, I formed you, I knitted you in your mother's womb, and then I ordained you and sanctified you and called you. While you were still in the womb, you had no idea. And you wouldn't have any idea until you would be much older. But in the womb is when I called you. And he goes on to say, verse 14, and I love this again. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. <laughs> Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. I, this is one of those places, and there are many in Scripture, where you just don't really get the sense that it's adequately expressed and communicated and articulated, fearfully and wonderfully made. What an understatement. It's too high for my understanding. And he just praises the Lord for the way he was formed and knitted together in his mother's womb. Well, verse 6. Now, this is <laughs> Jeremiah's response. Talk about not being able to really grasp it in terms of the expression. But this is his response, verse 6. Then said I, Ah, oh, Lord God. Why do you say it like that, Pastor? Because in the original language, this, this, ah, oh, is kind of like, no, Lord, no. Or if you want, if you prefer, you can see it and say it like this. Ah, oh, Lord. You see where this is going? And here it comes. You know what's coming next, right? You can finish the sentence, as it were. Uh, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a youth. In other words, Lord, you got the wrong guy. Ah, uh, Lord, <laughs> you picked the wrong file. Ah, uh, Lord, ah, Lord. No. And here come the excuses. And we've seen this before, right? I mean, every time God calls someone, they come up with excuses. I think about Moses. How many excuses did he come up with? 
And then Gideon. Well, we could talk a little bit about Gideon. I mean, he takes it to a whole new level. Okay, God. I'm, I'm the black sheep of my family. My family's the black sheep of my tribe, and my tribe's the black sheep of all of the tribes of Israel. I mean, he tries so, you got to hand it to him. He tries so hard to get out of this. And God's not having it. He's like, ah, uh, Lord, uh, you got the wrong guy. I, <laughs> he's hiding from the Midianites. He's <laughs> threshing the grain, hiding out from the Medeanites so they wouldn't steal it, in fear. And God come, comes to him and says, oh mighty warrior. Here's Gideon, right? Where? <laughs> oh me? Oh you talking to me? Ah uh, Lord, you got the wrong guy and here's why. And then here comes the excuses and then God's like, okay, whatever. And then he goes into the whole fleece thing. And by the way, I think it's unfortunate that we've somehow made this whole fleece thing a faith thing. It is not a faith thing. He's looking for ways to get out of it. Think about it. I mean, first, okay, do on the ground, but not on the fleece. And then God does it. And then he says, okay, just to be really, 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 really sure, confirmation we call it. Oh, we couch it in such spiritual terms. I need confirmation. What more do you need? Well, let's have the dew be on the fleece, but not the ground. And sure enough, you know what that would be the equivalent of? God, if this is really you calling me, and this is really your will, have a bird, a minor bird, because we don't like minor birds. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, have a minor bird fly into my windshield at 2.04 p.m. Hawaii Standard Time tomorrow afternoon. And then God does it. And you're like, okay, now to be really, really, really sure. No, that's, I'm, that's what he did. Talk about trying to get out of it. Now here's Jeremiah trying to get out of it. And interesting, he, he brings up, it's kind of reminiscent of what Moses said when God called him from out of the burning bush. And, and Moses is kind of like, you know, I've been here so long, you know, like 40 years, not just in the desert, the backside of the desert. And I, I seem to have, some believe he had developed a speech impediment. Because who's he going to talk to? And so now he's like, I, I, you know, I've been out. That ship sailed. And he uses that as an excuse, which is why, by the way, replete throughout the Old Testament, we read time and time again, God commanded Moses to command Aaron to speak to the people. Oh, you can't talk. Okay, fine. Your brother's going to do it then. How about that? You're not getting out of it. Nice try. And that's why. Well, now here's Jeremiah going, I cannot speak. And he takes it further. And again, you got to kind of hand it to him in his attempt to get out of this, because he says, I, I, I can't really speak because I'm still too young. I'm a youth. Now, we really don't know how old Jeremiah was. Of course, speculation abounds. Uh, some speculate that he was maybe in his late teens, early 20s. Others suggest that maybe he was 30. He would have likely not been older than 30, because you had to be 30 years of age to enter into the priestly service. But even then, you were considered to be young at that age, relative to that culture in that time. So this is kind of like what Paul exhorted Timothy concerning. Timothy, you're younger than the people in the church that you pastor, and you're letting them intimidate you. Stop it. Don't let him do that. 
Don't let them look down on you because of your youth. Now this is where being a PK comes back into play because if you're Jeremiah and God calls you, this is understandable. Ah uh, Lord, <laughs> ah Lord, ah Lord. <laughs> um, so they're not going to listen to me. You know, first of all, they're going to look at me and they go, come on. I knew you when you were in diapers, and you're prophesying to me? Who do you think you are? Don't you know who I am? You're just, you're Hilkiah's son. That's Hilkiah's kid. Get out of here. What are you doing here? <laughs> and you're prophesying? Thus saith the Lord? Come on. This is a joke. Where are the hidden cameras? Is this a And so that's his reasoning and his attempt to try to get out of this. I'm, they're not going to listen to me. Uh, I'm too young and I cannot speak into their lives because they're not going to listen to me. Now listen to what <laughs> the Lord's response is. Verse 7, but the Lord said to me, do not say, I am a youth, for you shall go to all to whom I send you, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. If I'm Jeremiah, my heart is sinking to the floor right about now. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> You're still going to use me? Yeah. You're still going to send me? Yeah. But Lord, uh, Lord, <laughs> I just gave you excellent reasons as to why I'm the wrong guy. I'm not qualified. I don't have any experience. I'm not old enough, blah, 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 blah. Precisely. That's why I'm going to send you. Because you cannot speak. Because you are inexperienced because you are young. Paul would say it like this to the Corinthians, God chooses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, the weak to shame the strong. Why does God do that? Because then He alone gets the glory. Because they're going to look at Jeremiah and go, are you kidding me right now? <laughs> it has to be God. What He's speaking has to be God. It's not Him. Look, look at the, well, I'm getting ahead of myself again. This is what I love about God's call on my life. Even if I tried, I could not take the credit for what God has done. I mean, it's laughable. I love it when people look at me and go, here's why. Because Here's the conclusion. If God can use someone like that, there's hope for me. That's right. That's right. And that's Jeremiah. Verse 8. Now this is interesting. <laughs> Do not be afraid of their faces. Now you have to almost be a pastor to really appreciate this. Because what God is saying to Jeremiah is, do not get upset when you see the expression on their faces when you speak. Because <laughs> don't, don't be upset by their body language or their facial expressions. You know, because like right now, don't, don't look at the person next to you. I see your faces when I'm, when I'm teaching. And uh, Sometimes, you know, there's the, the wince. I have a whole list of them. I won't go through all of them in the interest of time. But, and then there's the contorting of the faces, kind of like. <laughs> or, as we say here in Hawaii, stink eye. That's what he's saying. Don't, don't look at their faces and be upset by them or afraid of them. Because they're going to react to what 
<laughs> you're going to say. Uh, you know, I, I've shared this before. I'm, I'm very candid about it. It's, it's, hey, listen, when you've lost your life in this world, you've got nothing to lose. But I have to admit that it still upsets me and bothers me and concerns me and even hurts me when somebody gets up in the middle of the teaching and leaves. It's like, <laughs> you know, oh, I'm sorry, was it something I said? Well, as one said, you throw a rack, in, a, a rack, a rock into a pack of dogs. The dog that barks the loudest is the dog that got hit the hardest. Don't take it personal. Jesus said, if, if they hate you, it's not you, don't, don't take it, they hate you because of me, because of your association with me. So if anybody's thinking about getting up in the middle of the Bible study, walking out, don't even think about it, <laughs> especially now. But Jeremiah, they're not going to receive what it is that you're going to say. And in fact, you're going to see the ugliest of reactions on their faces. Do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Do not concern yourself with their response. That's on them. So somebody gets up, walks out. I won't keep belaboring this point, but when that happens, in fact, in some ways, I think to myself, wow, Lord, you're really working on them, huh? You know, I almost would rather have somebody react that way than just kind of shine me on or blow me off. Yeah, hey, praise the Lord. <laughs> but when, you know, that was, that, was, that was interesting, wasn't it? But I, I would almost rather have somebody get agitated because you know the Holy Spirit's working on them. You know how it was before you came to Christ? Or even if you're under the heavy hand of the Lord's conviction in Christ, Oh, there's agitation, irritation, frustration. That's, that can be good. That's a good sign. There's something happening. The Lord's doing something there. Okay, now you can get up and walk out. <laughs> Verse 9, then the Lord put forth His hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have this day set you over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down, to destroy and to throw down. Thanks a lot. To build and to plant. Well, I like that part. Wait a minute. I, you're calling me to do some rooting out, some pulling down, some throwing down. Um, I like the idea of building and planting, but see, here's the thing, and notice the order of it. You can't build or plant until you first root out. There's some demolition, some pulling down, some rooting out that needs to take place before you can start the building and the planting. Well, this is a perfect textbook example of God packaging His calling with His enabling. Think this through with me. This is the calling of God on Jeremiah's life. And this is not going to be easy. How's Jeremiah going to do it? Jeremiah isn't going to do it. God is. Where's Jeremiah going to get the courage and the strength to do this? God's going to give it to him. The Lord is with him. The Lord will deliver him. The Lord will enable him. It's going to get hard. Jeremiah, there's going to be times, and this is why he's affectionately referred to as the weeping prophet. I mean, I, I picture him in the fetal position, just wailing and weeping before the Lord, crying out to the Lord. If there was ever a man that we have a record of in history, in Scripture, that was ever called to a horrendous and difficult 
ministry, it was Jeremiah. I think maybe even to the degree in which he would rival the Apostle Paul and all that he went through. I think you could put Jeremiah right into that camp, along with the likes of the Apostle Paul. So I'm calling you, but I will never call you unless I will also with that calling give you the enabling. Because again, when God commands us to do something or calls us to something, it is inconsistent with His character and nature to not see, a, see us through and provide us with all that we need in order to be found faithful in that which He's called us to. Because if He didn't do that, then He would not be God. Because that would be cruel at best, evil at worst, for God to command or call us to something and not enable us to do that which He's called us to do. Because God will never be party to our disobedience. God will never be party to our unfaithfulness. So Jeremiah, I'm calling you to this, and I know it's going to be very hard and very difficult, and you're going to suffer tremendously. And I just want you to know I'm going to be with you through it. I'm going to strengthen you in it and I'm going to enable you for it, because I've called you to it. Never think for a second that if God has called you, that He will not also enable you to do that which He's called you to do. Verse 11, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Jeremiah, what do you see? And I said, I see a branch of an almond tree. Then the Lord said to me, You have seen well, for I am ready to perform my word. Now this is going to be the first of two visions that God gives to Jeremiah to prepare him for the calling on him. And this first one is that of the branch of an almond tree. Now what's this about and why an almond tree? Well, Interesting, the almond tree is the very first tree to bud. Some believe and suggest that it buds as early as the month of January, the first of any trees. It is quick to bud. So what is God saying here? What is God doing here? Well, what God is doing here is reassuring Jeremiah that like that almond tree that is the first and very quick to bud, so too will he be quick to do what he said he would do in and through Jeremiah. I know again it's probably very cliche, but there is this saying, God said it, that settles it. And that's what this is about. If God said it, it's a done deal. This is what I said, now I'm going to perform it. And not only am I going to perform it, I'm going to be quick to perform it. Let's get, let's get on it. Let's do this. That's what the almond tree is about. Now he's going to get his second vision, verse 13. And the word of the Lord came to me the second time saying, what do you see? And I said, <laughs> I see a boiling pot and it is facing away from the north. Then, verse 14, the Lord said to me, Out of the north calamity shall break forth on all the inhabitants of the land. For behold, I am calling all the families of the kingdoms of the north, says the Lord. They shall come, and each one set his throne at the entrance of the gates of Jerusalem, against all its walls all around, and against all the cities of Judah. I will utter, verse 16, my judgments against them, concerning all their wickedness. And here's why. 
because they have forsaken me, burned incense to other gods, and worship the works of their own hands. Stay with me on this. This uh, boiling pot poured out, the judgment of God being poured out on the wickedness of the people. And this is the ministry that Jeremiah has. He has to proclaim this, prophesy this, speak this, judgment is coming. That's doom and gloom. No wonder they're going to contort their faces and want to kill me and hate me. And they're not going to listen to this. Oh, you're one of those doom and gloom preachers. Judgment is coming. The end is, I, it's not near, it's here. This is what I mean by the profound parallels. to Jeremiah's day concerning Judah. Boy, I don't know how else to say it. I mean, this is a reference to Babylon, which at this time was heating up like that boiling pot. And as a ruling empire would conquer Assyria and destroy Jerusalem. And it's pretty detailed here. Verse 15, at the entrance of the gates of Jerusalem, against all the walls all around, all the cities of Judah, it's coming. And this is why it's coming. Dare I say that in our world today, judgment is coming. Judgment is coming because of the wickedness the wickedness of people, the evil, the worship of other gods. This is interesting too, and I just want to draw your attention to it before we move on any further. But they worship the works of their own hands. Wow. Hmm. They worship these images, these false gods. They bow down to these graven images. and judgment would come. And it did. And it was horrific. And it was unthinkable. You know, I just hear my heart on this, and this is one of the reasons why the, the prophecy updates, especially as of late, have become so intensely difficult, is because it's not a popular message. And people don't really want to hear it. This is what's coming. This is what's happening. This is what's here. And this is why. Judgment is coming. We're on the cusp of the seven year tribulation when the wrath of God is poured out on a Christ rejecting world. And where are the prophets? Where are the pastors? Where are the watchmen? warning the people. We're going to see this when I think we get to about chapter 6. I want to spend a little bit of time on it, because see there were false prophets in Jeremiah's day that were telling the people what they wanted to hear. Oh, hey, don't listen to Jeremiah. It's all good. Peace, peace. It's all good. Yeah, he's, he's one of them doom and gloom, fire and brimstone guy. I don't listen to him. It's not in our lifetime. It's all good. Everybody thought the Lord was coming back. My great, 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 great grandfather, sorry, thought it was going to be in his lifetime. Oh yeah, well I can do one better than that. The Apostle Paul, 2,000 years ago, thought it could be in his lifetime. First Thessalonians chapter 4. We who are alive and remain will be caught up. He thought, hey, <laughs> Lord's coming back in my lifetime by God's design. The Lord could come back at any time. There's nothing 
that has to happen, and he could have. He didn't. Aren't you glad, by the way, because you weren't born yet, neither was I. <laughs> we would have missed the rapture. We wouldn't have even been here for it. But it could have, because there's nothing that had to happen before the rapture happened. That's the doctrine of imminence. Talked about it on Sunday a little bit. Sound doctrine of imminence, I should say. But where are the voices? Where are the watchmen sounding the alarm like Jeremiah in his day? Here's what's coming. I'll tell you where they are. They're self-silenced, because they know that if they do, this is what will happen. And they don't want it. I mean, in all fairness, you could honestly say maybe in some ways they've counted the cost, and it's too high, and they're unwilling to pay it. Because when you, like Jeremiah then, and us now, proclaim the Word of God, and warn the people so the blood is not on your hands, you had better count the cost, because it will cost you the spiritual warfare alone. And I speak from personal experience. You know, one of the interesting things, and it's, I, it happens all the time, whenever I take a little bit of time off. But for some reason it was really pronounced this time. So I had a couple of weeks where I just kind of, you know, wasn't in the pulpit, disconnected, just kind of, you know, like Jesus did, just got away from the multitudes, just got with the Father. And I noticed something very interesting. I, I, it's, it always happens, but it was really pronounced this time, the spiritual warfare. I mean, on a scale of 1 to 10, it was like 0.5. When I'm in the pulpit, it's um, on a scale of 1 to 10, about 1,510. <laughs> and I remember one day in particular, I, 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 and I started to get concerned. It's kind of like, wow, the, because I, I worry when the enemy leaves me alone, because, you know, like, hey, keep up the good work. You're, you know, for the kingdom of darkness. You know you're in trouble when the enemy sends you a thank you card or a gift card, you know. Thank you very much. When the enemy's attacking you, that's, that's a good sign. That's the litmus test that you pose a formidable threat. I remember waking up one morning, and I, and I you'll forgive me, but I, I just thought to myself, wow, so this is what it's like? I could get used to this. No, I mean, when I, please, when I say spiritual warfare, I, I want I want to, please understand, and I, I don't say this for any other reason. The Lord knows my heart. So please hear my heart and don't misunderstand me when I, when I say this. When I say spiritual warfare, I'm talking about an intensity in the realm, the spiritual realm, the attack on my mind, on my body, physically, emotionally, psychologically, mentally, mentally. The psychological, mental, spiritual warfare that I need to put on the helmet to protect my mind from the attacks of the enemy in the realm of the spiritual. So I'm out of the pulpit for a couple weeks, and the enemy's like, well, we got a couple weeks off. Let's go. Uh, here's a, a, an address until he's back in the pulpit. And then, oh, <laughs> yeah, so Sunday I'm back in the pulpit. Oh yeah, there it is. I knew it. <laughs> I've been expecting you. <laughs> oh yeah, I remember. It was nice while it lasted. Bring it on. That was Jeremiah's world. And that's anybody's world that is called to this. And I only say that to say this. I, I could see why, not to 
excuse it, but to explain it. I could see why men, pastors are silent. I, I, I get it. I, 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 can, I can see that. I, yeah, I get it. I get it. <laughs> In more ways than one, I get it. <laughs> I really get it. I mean, I get it after every Sunday. You know, I, yeah, that's enough of that. I think you get the point. And we're going to see this with Jeremiah. Verse 17, therefore, <clears throat> now this is really interesting, prepare yourself and arise and speak to them all that I command you. Do not be dismayed before their faces, lest I dismay you before them. Whoa! Did you catch that? You know what God's saying here? He's saying, don't you dare be afraid of them. Because if you fear them, I will give you over to that fear of them. And you will fear man. And Proverbs 29, 25 says, the fear of man brings a snare. But whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. In other words, Jeremiah, if you are going to be up and down based on their response or lack thereof, you won't make it. You know what's so interesting is that he remained faithful to the end through all of it. In other words, I don't care what man says. The only one that matters. You can all hate me and walk out on me and give stink eye to me, but I have an audience of one. And if God is pleased at the end of the day, that's all that matters. Because like Paul would say to the Galatians again, chapter 1, verse 10. He asks rhetorically, for am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Am I striving to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. He can't have it both ways. It's one or the other. I'm either going to be a man pleaser or a God pleaser. And in fact, if I'm pleasing to men, pretty good chance I'm not very pleasing to God. And it works both ways. If I'm pleasing to God, pretty good chance that I'm not very pleasing to man. Because see, man does not want to hear it, but man needs to hear it. And God has called me to it, and I want to please God even at the expense of not pleasing man. Can we just go back one more time, and then we're almost done. I won't bring it up again, <laughs> at least not for a while. Not tonight anyway, for the rest of the Bible study. But can we just talk one more time about the guy who gets up and leaves? <laughs> What are you going to say? No, we can't. Well, we are. So they get up and leave, right? Now, can you imagine if I shifted and tailored and crafted my entire teaching and ministry around one person who was displeased with me and what I said? Oh, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. You know what happened? You'll forgive me again. But then all of a sudden now we're going to be sensitive. <laughs> oh, you got it, didn't you? I hope so, because I don't want to have to go into this. Wait a minute. So you're telling me that now all of a sudden you're going to tone it down, soften it up, so that you don't hurt anybody's feelings? No, I you need to have your feelings hurt. I'd rather hurt you into heaven than be sensitive to you into hell. 
And if you really think about it, the gospel is not very sensitive. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's offensive by its very nature, because it basically says you're a sinner, and you need the Savior. And the good news is that Jesus died for you to save you. But the bad news is, and you're not going to like this, I know you don't want to hear this, but you need to hear this. You've sinned against God, and you need Jesus. And I know I might ruffle your feathers. <laughs> yeah, I better be really careful, because I can take that a little bit too far. I step on your toes. You can use whatever metaphor you want to use. I think that's not the problem. I think the problem is that more toes need to be stepped on. I mean, because of what's at stake, right? We're not talking about life and death. We're talking about eternal life and eternal death. We're talking about eternity here. And you want to just tippy-toe around this thing? No, we, we, we need to deal with this head on, straight up. Yeah, but that's kind of insensitive. Well, I'm going to be insensitive in Jesus' name then. That's enough of that. Let's finish up verse 18. For behold, I love this, I have made you, Jeremiah, this day <laughs> a fortified city and an iron pillar and bronze walls against the whole land. That's what I'm talking about. Eh? Against the kings of Judah, against its princes, against its priests, and against the people of the land. Oh, verse 19, they will fight against you, but <laughs> they shall not prevail against you. For I am with you, says the Lord, to deliver you. Oh, I would venture to say that throughout that 40 very, very hard years, 40 plus years, that Jeremiah hung on to this promise for dear life with everything he had to that promise, because he would need it. Oh, they're going to fight you, man. They are going to come against you. But check this out. I have fortified you like a fortified city. You're going to be like iron pillars. Me? Yeah, you. Bronze walls. Me? Yeah, you. And you're going to come against them. They're going to come against you. But when you come against them, guess who's going to prevail? You are, because I am with you. Oh, they're going to try. They're going to do everything they can to get to you, back at you, to destroy you, because of their hatred for you. But I'm going to deliver you, because I'm with you. What a great way to end <laughs> a chapter with it, a Bible study with a promise that doesn't just apply to Jeremiah. I think we do err greatly when in a Bible study like this in the Old Testament, we go, well, that's then. No, it's not. It's us now. Sorry, I'm yelling. <laughs> not really. This applies to us. Didn't Jesus say, I will never leave you or forsake you? Lo, I am with you always, even to the uttermost parts of the earth, even the windward side of Oahu. <laughs> and I will be with you. I will never leave your side. I will be with you through it all. Watch me now. You'll see. Oh, and we will see, Lord willing, and if the Lord tarries, can't wait. Why don't you stand? Capone, why don't you come up? We'll close. Ah, I love this. Man, I just don't want it to end. Right? You know how it is with a, <laughs> with a really good movie? 
Not that I watch movies, I'm talking about other people. <laughs> it's so good, you just don't want it to end, man. Oh, we are in, I'll say it again, and then we'll end, but we are in for a treat. When we're done with this book, Jeremiah is going to be a friend. We are going to know him intimately, and he will become a close friend of ours through our study of this book. Father in heaven, thank you so much. Lord, just wow. I mean, what can we say? How do we pray? Just thank you. Thank you for Jeremiah. Thank you for the calling you had on his life. Thank you for his faithfulness in spite of everything that happened in his ministry, everything that happened to him and against him, and just how you were there for him, enabling him, empowering him, strengthening him, never forsaking him. Lord, thank you. Thank you that that is available for us now, here, today in that calling that you have on our lives. And it doesn't have to be a prophetic or pastoral calling. We all have a calling on our lives as a priesthood. And Lord, thank you that you package it with the empowering of the Holy Spirit. We love you so much, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Salvation, the most important decision of your life, is as simple as ABC. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. John 3.16 A. Admit that you are a sinner. Here's the bad news. We all have a problem. It's called sin. Our lives are not how God intended them to be. The consequence of sin is eternal death. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23 For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
Romans 6.23 B. Believe in Jesus Here's the good news. God gives us so much that He can forgive any sin, no matter how big or how small. God sent His Son Jesus to die on the cross to save us from sin. Jesus said that if you put your trust in Him, you will have eternal life. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in Him shall have eternal life. John 6.40 C. Confess that Jesus is Lord When Jesus rose from the grave, He proved His victory over eternal death. God wants you to confess that Jesus is Lord of all. He is your Savior. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. Romans 10.9 I suggest praying the following prayer to accept Christ as your Savior. Dear God, I know I am a sinner, and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe Jesus Christ is your Son. I believe that He died for my sin and that you raised Him to life. I want to trust Him as my Savior and follow Him as Lord. From this day forward, guide my life and help me do your will. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Welcome to the Forever Family of God.